I'm not being able to get, hang on, stop share. Let's move this over here, move this over here and go share screen again. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to share screen and going to pick this one. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, welcome to the March anniversary meeting, March 2022, 100 years of London Center. And I apologize, it's the same picture I had last month, but I couldn't find any other ones. And I think you're going to have lots of them later on. So. We'll leave this one as it is. Uh, tonight, we have uh, David Levy, who's uh, going to take a few minutes. I have some quick news, Dale Armstrong's monthly observing report, and then the history of London Centre, Peter, Mark, and hopefully Eric will see when it comes in. I have one piece of news, and it's stupendous news, amazing news, the best news ever. It's alive. Is. JWST, they finished the final phasing. They've still got some months of stuff to go. This star, two mass, a whole bunch of numbers. Uh, I tried to find it on the Sky X and it didn't have that, but it had the Tycho number and the star is in the database. This is an 11th magnitude star, about 26 parsecs away. And look how bright it is and look at the diffraction pattern. It's, it's amazing. Um, this is a deep red image, so it, it enhances the star. And even a couple of these little galaxies, like this one here off to the left, are, are actually in the Sky X. It's a, a really nice program if you feel like spending money. And because it's all on subscription now, but it's, it's a wonderful program for telescope control, etc. And that's all of my news, I think. J, JWST, I was so fearful that it might um, just, something would go wrong with it. Um, but anyway, monthly observing report and the, the constellation of the month that I chose is Ursa Major, one of my favorites. And now I will stop the share and turn it over to Dale. Oh, did it stop the share? It's still on my, oh, it's still on my screen, so I'll get to F5 backlight. There we go. Take it away, Dale. Okay, thanks. I'll try a, a screen yeah. share here, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Excuse me, Dale, but is it okay if I do my little poetic quote? To start oh, off for you? <laughs> I forgot sure, you again, David. Sure, okay. go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dale, and then I'll bring it right back to you. This is an interesting poem that was written by one of the women members of the London Center back in 1925 or so, shortly after the center was founded. <clears throat> and uh, it's kind of interesting, and I thought I would share that with you. And thank you, Peter. Um, I need to get the full name of the poet, <clears throat> but here it goes. It's to Dr. Kingston and Dr. White, who led youth by day and age by night. We dedicate these lines to voice our pride in these two men of learning at our side. It gives us joy supreme to know that we may meet so often in their company, for in their wisdom they do make us wise. When we would seek to penetrate the skies, they play a worthy part upon life's stage a noble type of manhood of the age. And as we worship as their friendships shrine, we great exceed esteem and love for them combine. Thus we dedicate these lines so airy to our president and secretary. And uh, I think there will be another poem uh, written to when the Kingston Center has its centennial to a, uh, to Dr. West, Dr. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Western, who obviously is a famous professor at Queens, just as Dr. Kingston is the famous professor and founder of the Lender Center here in London. And so with that, back to you, Dale. Thank you. Sorry, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So we'll try the share, share screen here. We'll see how it works. And I'll go full screen on this. And there we go. So, so yeah, so this is an interesting month, 100 years of the Lemon RESC. Well, let me um, get started here. I'm going to just start off with the pictures that people have taken uh, in the last month or so. So we'll just do a little RESC imaging. And um, so this is a picture of the Rosette Nebula taken by Iwa Pasek. And you can see a, a fabulous amount of detail in there. I think it was because she used her five inch refractor for this, although you'd have to look on the forums to check and see. And then Caitlin's been really busy on our extremely cold winter nights we've been having, um, the Jellyfish Nebula right here. And um, also a photograph of the Tadpole Nebula and as well, she's turned her set up to galaxies. And we have M81 and M82 here. So this is certainly encouraging when we see galaxy pictures as we move into spring. And you can see this is a neat picture. You can see these tiny little pink clouds here. And these are hydrogen clouds in the spiral arms of the galaxy, which are, of course, stellar nurseries where stars are being born. So very good stuff. Uh, Bill's, Bill put up a picture from Killarney. Uh, at first, when you look at that, you might say, oh, the sky at Killarney, what's wrong with it? But it's because there's a full moon there. And even in Killarney with a full moon, you can still see way more stars than you can see in London, Ontario on a dark of the moon night. And then in terms of what's up in the sky, there's a few things going on, nothing really special. But <clears throat> checking the comet news, um, the first four comets on that list are evening objects. And they can be seen uh, in six inch or smaller telescopes. So uh, if you have a clear night and you get out to a dark site, that is certainly something worth tracking down. Uh, and then in the morning sky, the planets are coming back now. So this from Sky and Telescope, if you're facing southeast about 45 minutes before sunrise in mid-March, you'll see three planets. And um, on March the 29th, Venus and Saturn will just be two degrees apart. And on April the 4th, Mars and Saturn will be half a degree apart. So that's kind of interesting. Now, with Saturn just starting to show up on our skies, Sky and Telescope, if you go to their website, uh, has a whole feature on Saturn. And it's quite interesting because they make the point that with uh, Saturn being back in season, you want to be looking for white spots. And periodically, there's uh, disturbances in Saturn's atmosphere. Not very often, but they do happen. And they highlight this one here, take, uh, which was discovered by Will Hayes in 1933. And this is his sketch. And uh, here's, a, here's a, one of the more recent ones photographed by the, with the Cassini spacecraft. And of course, once, once you have something like this on Saturn, it's fascinating to see it evolve over time. And it also makes the rapid motion of the planet pretty apparent too. So that's something to have in the back of your mind this season with Saturn. Uh, Sky and Telescope had a few interesting things, so I just thought I'd touch on several of those. Uh, first of all, we've got asteroids uh, this month and the next month. We've got three spring asteroids right here. Um, uh, Flora, Hygieia, and uh, Enomia. And the brightest of the three, they're all about magnitude 10, is going to be Hygieia at magnitude 9.3. And it's well placed here, Libra, Virgo. And it's not moving too quickly, but it's moving quickly enough. You could follow it from night to night. And you could also, if you were a photographer, do a nice animation of the motion of the asteroid through space. So that's a couple of ideas, something to think about. With three asteroids, you should probably get out and look at at least one of them. I was really, I really thought this was a very interesting article in Sky and Telescope. I mean, when you consider the history of uh, amateur observations, and I guess that's one of the things we're doing this month. I mean, amateurs started off making their own telescopes in the 50s because you couldn't really buy telescopes. And then as telescopes became commercially available, you know, large telescopes in the 1970s were six inch telescopes or eight inch telescopes. And it was the rare amateur who had a 10 or 12 inch telescope. And very few people even knew someone who had a telescope that big. And we had the Dobsonian revolution starting in the late and starting in the late 70s and into the 80s, these things were commercialized and amateurs had access to telescopes as large as 17 and a half inches. And this really spurred uh, deep sky observing, which became a big thing in the 1980s. I mean, in 1980, the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, I guess 1981, 
they introduce their MASHA certificate, which is something I encourage everybody to do because it, it, you get to learn this guy and you get to discover all the, the bright and interesting things that you can look at. Well, amateurs have moved on as telescopes have gotten bigger. And this article, I'll come back to it. Why it's so neat is because somebody's observing large quasar groups. Now, I'll just draw your attention to the center of this chart, the magnitude. So now amateurs are getting into the range we're looking at where they're looking at 18th to 19th magnitude objects. Now, the fellow that, that published this article in Sky and Telescope, of course, is using a 32-inch F4 Newtonian. So these, these super large telescopes are rare as hen's teeth, and uh, you need to have a good, uh, a good setup uh, in order to store these things and use them. There's an example of a, a, one of the largest amateur telescopes in North America, and it's probably about 40 inches longer than that 32-inch F4. Interesting stuff. Now, the other thing I'll just draw your attention to is Sky and Telescope had an article on Markarian's galaxy chain. And that's a great spring, spring object. We've got the back of Leo the lion here in Denebola. And right off of there, of course, you're into the uh, coma cluster of galaxies. And there's a, a chain of galaxies in here that you could look for this month. And they're highlighted here in yellow. And there's about, I guess, nine of them there. And that's about a two degree field of view. Now my six inch F5 has a three degree field of view. So I'm kind of looking forward to getting out there and trying that telescope on the galaxies because I haven't really had a chance to do that yet. And this, uh, this chain extends to the west. You can see these, all these galaxies in kind of a mauve purple. And it also extends to the east as well. So this is, I mean, you could spend a night just looking at these and examining them all at various magnifications. So that's something to consider getting out and doing. And there's a, there's a photograph showing that chain of galaxies, and that would be kind of a neat thing to look at, or of course, to photograph as well. Uh, I'll just end off with this slide here. Uh, we're gonna have the club observing weekend is scheduled for the next new moon weekend, and that'll be April the 1st, 2nd at Fingal. And there's um, four of our guys there in our OBS2. And I, while I'm on this slide, and because we're looking at astronomical history in terms of the London Center, I'll just note we're really privileged to own a piece of astronomical history right here. I mean, what you're looking at in this picture is a Byers Series 2 mount, which was donated to the center some years ago. And um, these, are, these are quite rare mounts. And they were also quite good mounts. Um, I just pulled this article from a 1998 symposium in California. And it's sort of a tribute to Edward Byers. Astronomical telescopes without astronomical telescope mounts without periodic error. And it notes that anyone who's been interested in amateur astronomy over the last three decades has probably heard the name Ed Byers. Ed is a consummate machinist who just happens to be the world's best manufacturer of telescope mounts and drives for the amateur and small professional user. Worm gears and drives are his specialty. And these were the, the top mounts. Ours is a series two and it goes on to say, Ed's real jewels are the series two, three and four mounts. The series two was and is still the state of the art for the advanced amateur or professional astronomer. The first series two was built in the middle 1970s. Many of the astrophotographs published today in such magazines as Sky and Telescope and Astronomy were taken with series two mounts. Um, now, of course, paramount and astrophysics have superseded these mounts now, but in terms of state-of-the-art machining, uh, these things are really still something else. There's a picture of Ed Byers with a Series 4, a couple of his Series 4 mounts, if you want to get an idea of how big these things go. And I'll just end off with this picture here as a close-up. Now, one of the things that makes this mount so special, uh, not only are Ed's worms and gears virtually perfect, that was his reputation, but also, the setting circles on these mounts are finely engraved and are extremely accurate. So this is, this is another way you can use this mount. You can employ, employ some of the finest setting circles ever made to use our Celestron 14 to track things down in the sky. OK, well, that's it for me. So I'll pass it back to, I'll pass it back to you guys. Now let me see. Uh, I'll just stop the share, and it should go back. Yeah, we're back now. Um, I could reshare my uh, PowerPoint, but I have one slide left, and it just uh, just shows the club crest with a 1922 to 2022, and we've seen the club crest already. So I will turn it over to Peter, 
who will be the MC for the rest of the meeting here tonight. So take it away, Peter. Hi, Rick, thank you very much. And certainly a, a, a warm welcome to all of you this evening for our more or less official 100th anniversary, which is we're gonna to celebrate tonight. You'll hear some of the dates as we go along here that were significant in the center's history. And uh, so we've decided that Eric Clinton and myself and Mark Toby are each gonna make some presentations to kind of fill things in. And between the three of us, we agreed that Mark would speak first. Mark, would you like me to introduce what you're planning or would you like to just jump right in? I'd uh, love you to introduce what I'm planning actually, Peter, that'd be great. Excellent, okay. So as most of you will know, Mark is a professional historian and a uh, and now represents history and the RASC at the Cronin Observatory as the more or less official historian of the Cronin Observatory. And that is of course wonderful because it gives Mark a chance to look after some of the wonderful things about history. And one of the things that Mark has made himself very familiar with is our founder, Harold Reynolds Kingston. And so Mark is planning to talk about H.R. Kingston and how he contributed to the London Center by being part of the community here in London. Take it away, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So what I would like to do, first of all, is demonstrate uh, the latest gadget that we have here in the observatory, which is a projector from 1930, which is designed to project slides that look a little bit like this. So this astronomical slide that you can see here, this one says NGC 3115 sextants. Um, that is a slide probably from the 20s or the 30s. Um, and it's the kind of slide that H.R. Kingston would have used to give talks back in the day. And he would have used a kind of projector called a lantern slide projector because back in the day, they actually had lanterns being used to do the projection instead of light bulbs in the pre-electricity era because these things go back to the 1700s, uh, amazingly. And um, uh, photography was really a late camera when it comes to this kind of slide. So um, I managed to find a box full of slides at the Cronin, which probably Kingston would have used back in the day. And I also managed to find a radio talk that H.R. Kingston gave back in the day. Um, and I wanna show you, first of all, uh, just what an image from one of these projectors looks like, because I just happen to have um, a lantern slide projector right here. You see that? Look at that bad boy. Before there was Zoom, before there were even movies, there were lantern slides. And so I'm just gonna try and fire this up here and see if I can show you an image on the screen behind me. There we go. So it's coming up and let's just pan up dramatically here. Ah, look at that, a lantern slide. And then if you wanted to switch the lantern slide, all you would do is you would reach over and you could change the slide like that. So they would go back and forth like this. And as you will see in the slide deck, I've tried to simulate that back and forth action of the projector. Okay, and this slide that you see here was particularly remarkable. It's a train going through space. And the caption, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, if an express train left the earth on the 4th of July, 1776, it would not be here yet. And so it's that particular slide that inspired me to recreate H.R. Kingston's wonderful universe talk, the talk he gave on January the 5th, 2020, uh, 1922, 100 years ago, approximately. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna do this with Zoom and digitized versions of these slides rather than the lantern slide projector for that clean, crisp signal. So I'm gonna unplug the lantern slide projector here and tell you just a little bit about H.R. Uh, Kingston and uh, then give you just a little recreation of the event that kicked off the Lennon Center. So um, I'm gonna share my screen here. 
And uh, with some kind of luck, uh, you will now see a picture of H.R. Kingston on the screen. Uh, let me know when H.R. Kingston appears full size here. Okay, we got that. Um, and what about the, uh, the zoom bar? Is that on the screen as well? Or is there a funny shadow over the screen? No. You're all good. All good. Okay, so Harold Reynolds Kingston. Harold Reynolds Kingston, that R, his middle initial is Reynolds, was a mathematics professor with a genial nature and exacting standards. As such, he was known amongst his students as the smiling executioner although in this photograph, he is less smiling and more executioner. This is a picture of Kingston in 1918 when he was 32 years old. At that time, he was an assistant professor in mathematics at the University of Manitoba. He was actively involved in the Winnipeg Center um, as secretary treasurer and then later on as president. He left the University of Manitoba to take up a position at Western University in 1921. And he appears in the Western University 1922 uh, convocation um, supplement. Here we are, there's the 1922 convocation supplement as professor of mathematics. There was no London Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada when he arrived in London. And so, uh, when he came to Western, he seems to have wasted no time at all in setting one up. On January the 5th, 1922, he gave a public lecture, the one I mentioned before, at the London Public Library called Our Wonderful Universe. And it would have almost certainly been a lantern slide projector. When you look at other talks that are announced in that day, they explicitly mention lantern slides. When the Cronin Observatory opened in 1940, meetings would certainly be held right here where I am in the Cronin Observatory. However, that was 18 years away. So um, in the intervening years, lectures for the Rask London Center were given at the public library, um, like this one. Uh, and the public library, I should add, was just north of the YMCA on, uh, Wellington Street, just near Queens. Of course, both of these buildings are gone now, but, but this photograph was very helpful to me because I had always conflated the YMCA or thought they were in a slightly different position, but the library was the, was the building just to the north of the old YMCA building. And uh, the lecture that Kingston gave, of course, was the spark that led in quite short order to the establishment of the London Center. And here is a little taste of the interior of the old London Public Library. So you just get a bit of a flavor of that space, the kind of place in which he would have been giving that lecture. And the first meeting of the London Center were held at Western University, which at that time was shared uh, with Huron College and would have been near the corner of St. James and St. George Street. And that's what Western and Huron College looked like at that time. However, 1922, we're already looking ahead to the future, certainly Western is, and uh, that convocation supplement I showed you earlier included a picture of the Governor General, uh, then Lord Bing, breaking ground for the first time on the new campus, uh, specifically University College, which at the time would have been called the Arts Building. That 1922 convocation supplement um, included an almost astronomical poem. And our own David Levy is here to read it for us. You may also be on mute, David. David. He's there. I guess he hasn't realized that he's has, that he's muted his microphone. Yeah, he's muted and he's unmuted, and now we're ready for the poem. Can you hear me now? Beautifully. Okay, this is the first of the two poems that uh, Mark 
gave for me today. And this is called, very originally, a poem. <laughs> An afterglow across the western sky, the glory spent sun is dying. And mellow lights and saffron shadows lie, where day is last is sign, where day its last is sign. A concord of sweet thoughts is painted on God's blue canvas with earth untainted. And this is from page 56 of Western University's Convocation Supplement for 1922. Beautifully read, David. Thank you so, so much. So one cannot help but wonder, given that this was 1922, whether Kingston or uh, some other budding poet in London had a hand in this. Uh, and it certainly will we'll visit another poem later. But meanwhile, let's check in with H.R. Kingston on the 5th of January, 1922. And one of the things that I have here is H.R. Kingston's actual hat. This is his top hat that he wore for ceremonial occasions. And I think you will agree with me that occasions don't get much more ceremonial than the 100th anniversary of the organization that you founded, because indeed H.R. Kingston founded the London Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And so here I present in the guise of H.R. Kingston, uh, his lecture from 1922 that got it all going. During the past 25 years, from 1905 to 1930, astronomers have become more and more interested in the outlying regions of our universe. This interest has been stimulated by the wonderful development of instruments, instruments for the study of the stars. Our great telescope at Victoria, BC, whose mirror is six feet in diameter, and the world's mightiest telescope over eight feet in diameter on Mount Wilson near Pasadena, California, have put into the hands of modern astronomers a power for penetrating the depths of the universe that was unknown a generation ago. Further, there has been a correspondingly marvelous development of new and powerful instruments which can be attached to our telescopes for various kinds of research, such as determining the kinds of gases in the atmospheres of the stars, the sizes of the stars, their distances from us, the speeds at which they are moving, their temperatures, and a great many other facts which must be known before we can have any adequate idea of our universe. Thus far, no telescope has been made sufficiently powerful to magnify a star to anything beyond a mere bright point. Possibly someday, supergiant telescopes will be made which will be powerful enough to show up a star as a little round disk. But the marvelous thing is that even though no telescope now in existence is powerful enough to enable us to see the size of any star, yet, an instrument called an inferometer has been devised, which when attached to the largest telescope actually tells us the sizes of the stars. By this means, we have found that many stars are larger than our sun and some of them nearly 100 million times as large. It might be of interest here to state that up to 1928, all of the glass discs for the large mirrors for telescopes were made in Europe. Kingston wrote this in 1930, so 1928. But in February of that year, a 70 inch disc was unveiled at the Bureau of Standards at Washington, which in a molten state had been put away carefully eight months before and had been allowed to cool very, very slowly. During all that time, in order to produce a uniformly excellent grade throughout the entire mirror. This mirror that you can see in the slide weighs about 5,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds. It is evident from this that the construction of mirrors for very large telescopes 
is a most difficult matter indeed. Before we can properly discuss the regions beyond the Milky Way, we must say something about the Milky Way itself. Indeed, most of my talk tonight will be about the Milky Way, or as it is often called, the galaxy. On any clear night, when there is no moon, the Milky Way looks like a faint, pearly, somewhat irregular band across the sky, where the stars are much more numerous than in other parts of the heavens. Most of us probably do not think of those stars lying away from the Milky Way as having anything to do with it. And yet, yet, the fact is that all the stars that we can see with the naked eye in every direction and hundreds of millions that only the telescope aided by the most sensitive photographic plates can bring to us all form a part of the Milky Way. But you say, most of the stars are not in the direction of the Milky Way. Hence, how can they be a part of it? To answer this, let me give an illustration. Imagine a large Ferris wheel, about 10 times as high as it is wide. That is, if each seat is three feet wide, the Ferris wheel is about 30 feet high. Now, suppose that hundreds of lights are hung all through the Ferris wheel. And suppose further that you are standing on a little platform up close by the axle of the wheel. You will readily see as you look out towards the edge of the wheel, that is towards the seats, you will see many more lights. <clears throat> You will see many more lights. The lantern slide projector is beach balling at the moment. I had no idea that lantern slide projectors could do that, but um, <laughs> that's that's where we're at with this. Um, you will see many more lights. Testing, testing, is this thing on? You will readily see as you look out towards the edge of the wheel, that is towards the seats, you will see many more lights than when you look out sideways along the axle of the wheel. It is just like this when we look out at the stars. All the stars that we see belong to the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not just the rim of a wheel around us, but it is the whole wheel or disk. Now, it happens that our sun, which of course is one of the stars, is somewhat near the center of this disk, and the earth is very close to the sun, and therefore we are right in the midst of an immense Ferris wheel shape, an immense Ferris wheel shaped swarm of stars. 3,000 miles across Canada, is a very great distance of thought of in terms of the distance over which we ordinarily move in a day. But if we are making a 25,000 mile trip around the world, we do not consider 3,000 miles very great. When we think of the 93 million miles separating us from the sun, we feel that it is a great distance when compared with any distances between places here on the Earth. If an express train traveling at 60 miles per hour left the sun on the 4th of July, 1776, it would not be here yet. But suppose we ask ourselves, how far is it from our sun to the nearest other sun, that is, to the nearest star in the heavens? This distance turns out to be 270,000 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Most of the stars are hundreds and even thousands of times as far away as the nearest star. Surely then, surely we are not wrong when we say that the Earth is relatively very close indeed to the Sun. When we go beyond our Sun's nearest starry neighbor, 
and consider the stars, which are thousands of times as far away as this one, we can only gasp at the array of figures. However, after all, the situation is not entirely hopeless. The trouble is that a mile is altogether too short a measuring stick for the stupendous distances we have to consider. Let us now step out into space with a good big measuring rod. We shall take from this the distance that light or electricity or a radio wave travels in one year. Now, a light wave or a radio wave will travel over seven times around the earth at its equator in one second or 186,000 miles in a second. In a year, at this unthinkable speed, light will cover six million millions of miles. This tremendous distance we shall now take as our yardstick. Surely, a measuring stick six millions of millions of miles long will be adequate for measuring any distance. We call this distance a light year, since it is the distance light travels in one year. Now, let us step aboard a beam of light train and start to explore the Milky Way and beyond. Fast, but not furious, will be our trip. And don't forget that in every single second, we are going to travel 186,000 miles. Our conductor calls, all aboard, and we are off. We cannot stop at the moon. Indeed, we are past the moon before we have drawn our first breath. In fact, before our third heartbeat, it takes us a second and a quarter to reach the moon. No, we do not stop at the moon. In fact, we have only about time to remove our coats and hats and get comfortably settled for our trip and read the first comic strip in the evening paper when our conductor announces the first station, the sun, where we arrive just eight minutes after leaving the earth. The sun is not very hospitable just now for a number of terrific cyclones are in action there. They call them sunspots, sunspots back there on the earth and anyhow, we must hurry on. As we start on, we turn again to our evening paper and by and by become tired of reading. We glance at our watches and find that an hour has passed. Just then our conductor comes along and we say, how long till the next stop? Oh, bless your heart, says the conductor. You aren't getting restless yet, are you? We don't reach the next sun till over four years from now. Wow, did you not tell us this was a fast train going 186,000 miles every second? Yes, that is correct, and we are keeping right up to schedule, but you must remember that this is a big country out here. It will take us 15,000 years to get to the side of the Milky Way at its narrowest, and if we go to its farthest edge, we shall require 10 times as long, that is about 150,000 years. And since we started from near the center of the galaxy, we shall even then have traversed only halfway across our galaxy. In some parts of the universe, there are great families or clusters of stars, sort of miniature galaxies when compared with the Milky Way, in one of those, the star cluster in Hercules, there are 35,000 suns brighter than our sun. And it would take us on our beam of light train 160 years to cross from one, one side of this cluster to the other. But we ask, is there anything beyond the Milky Way? Yes, he says. There are thousands of other galaxies of stars. And a striking thing about them is that a very large number of them appear to be huge whirlpools. They are called spiral nebulae. And being beyond our own galaxy, they have been also described as island universes. They contain immense numbers of stars and clouds of gas, many of which we believe are gradually condensing into stars. Probably if, if one of these, from one of them we could look back upon our own galaxy, it too would be a great whirlpool of stars. How far away are these galaxies? Well, the farthest that we can reach with our present largest telescope 
are about 140 million light years away. But is there anything beyond them or are they at the outer edge of creation? Now, says our conductor, this is too big a question for me, but at present, we cannot answer it with certainty, but it seems probable that other galaxies extend on and on and on, but the end or boundary is still an open question. And that is the end of H.R. Kingston's talk. Uh, so words by H.R. Kingston, slides by the Cronin Observatory. And so very likely he used some of those slides in his early talks, uh, maybe even some of the ones that we saw here tonight. However, there's one last thing. H.R. Kingston was, of course, the first president of the London Center. The first vice president was Grace Blackburn, who was uh, an accomplished writer and poet, and of course, a member of the Blackburn family that founded the London Free Press. And it turns out that um, not only was she VP, um, VP number one in the London Center, but she also wrote an astronomy poem. And it's a lovely little poem called The Evening Star. And I thought it would be particularly lovely to conclude this section of the evening with David reading the poem for us. So Thank you. David, take it away. Thank you so much, Mark. Before I read this poem, while I was listening to your fabulous talk and seeing the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson that I've visited and looked through, seeing the uh, 200 inch, which would have been opened long after the London Center was founded, and uh, being watch and watching the launch on Christmas morning of the Webb Space Telescope, it reminded me of how we are how how we are getting more and more of an astronomical community to understand to greater depths the universe of which we are a part. I loved the watching the launch of the Webb Telescope, but the best part of it was not the launch. It was Administrator Nelson's speech after the launch. He talked about the people who were, <clears throat> he talked about the people who were involved in the building and the launching of the telescope. And at the end, he also mentioned a young shepherd boy in the Middle East who looked up at the night sky and wrote a poem and later on, became the King of Israel. That poem is the 19th Psalm to which I add one line written out by my late friend, Peter Collins. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night revealeth knowledge so long as the sky is clear. And now the evening star. Above the sunset's many tinted bar, where light on light, a smiling iris nigh, mellows to mystery of near and far, swings passionately pale, the evening star, queen of the twilight, from a conquered sky, she smiles to see the day grow faint and die. Thank you, Grace Blackburn. Thank you so much, Mark. And back to you. Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much for everyone. And on that happy note, I will turn it over uh, to Peter to uh, introduce our next section. Thank you very much, Mark. I'd like to echo what David said about how much fun it was to listen to your presentation. It really put me in the mood of 1922 so that we can really get a sense of uh, time and the fact that it's our centennial this evening. And I couldn't resist. I did the calculations. And of course, not to be surprised, but Professor Kingston was absolutely right. A train leaving the sun in 1776 would only have arrived at the earth in 1953. And of course, that's already feels like forever ago, but from the point of view of 1922, that was still far in the future. So now our next phase is to uh, turn over the microphone to Eric Clinton. And Eric's going to talk about some of the one, fun, one uh, wonderful and fun things that the London Center's done and uh, in its existence. Eric is a many time secretary of the London Center, a longtime newsletter editor, an amateur astronomer basically all his life. 
and one of the few folks who uh, is available today on this call who's been a member of the London Centre longer than I have. So, Eric, it's a pleasure to invite you to uh, give your talk now. And you're okay to share screen? Yep, I'll do that in a sec. Um, yep. I was a member, I joined in 1972, that was 50 years ago. I was 17 and on my very first meeting, it was the night of the election and I got told, I was volunteered as the secretary and I held that for uh, six years, and no, three years, three years as treasurer 16 years as editor, two years as VP, and three years as net rep. So, yeah, if you, if, for those of you who don't know me, but I, most of you know me. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the early years. Um, Mark touched on a few things, so I'll skip some slides. Uh, is that slide showing now? Good. <clears throat> Are you seeing the first slide? I can't tell. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, thanks. So the minutes of the inaugural meeting of January 18, 1922, Dr. Kingston was elected as chair. Uh, Mr. White was named secretary and it was moved by uh, Reverend Bowen and seconded by Ms. Blackburn that those present formed themselves into the center to be known as the London Center. Uh, that was moved and uh, adopted and it was decided to hold meetings on the second Friday of every month. So the next meeting was on February 10th and they uh, had contacted the RESC head office and uh, requested the, to uh, join. Um, at, there were 16 original members uh, and six, 16 charter members. And the requirement was 25 members to be uh, an RAC center. And uh, they did get that. Um, and membership was $2 on the uh, February meeting, they, no, no, April, sorry, next meeting. Now, Mark mentioned a lot about uh, Harold Ren Reynolds Kingston. So he, uh, he was, um, um, after he left Winnipeg and, and, and started the London Center, he, uh, let me see now, oh yes. So he was president from 1922 until 1930. Honorary president and from then until 1970. At the National Society, he was VP in 1927 and president in 1930 and 31. He passed away in 63. And as his role in the London Center would be hard to overestimate as he was constantly involved in all the meetings and activities for nearly 40 years. Um, many of the meetings started out with a handbook study and he, he, he did that uh, role. The, um, uh, Mark talked about the public lecture, uh, then the, the uh, you know, there's nothing new on there. There's another image of the um, here in college. At the March meeting, uh, Dr. Kingston presiding, a letter was read from the General Secretary of the Society outlining the National Council's intent to grant London Center money for the fiscal year 22. Um, the topic for that evening was other worlds in our solar system in which Dr. Kingston demonstrated the apparent retrograde motion of planets across the sky. Lantern slides are shown as well as photographs of Mars and Jupiter and faces of Mercury. Copies of the observer's handbook and the journal were distributed to all the members. At the April 7th meeting, uh, uh, there were uh, four more members elected um, to the center. Um, you had to be um, nominated and elected to join the London Center. And that went on for many, many, many years. At the May meeting, they held it at the, uh, the normal school, which is a, or then was a teacher's college. Today it's the YMCA. Um, so, 
And back in 22, there were, it would have been very few homes in that area. So uh, it was probably a darker sky. They had four telescopes there to observe the planets, double stars. And uh, that was the closing meeting of the, of the season. Picked up again in October, five more members were elected. And uh, they, uh, they referred to that night as a social night, what we would have called a members night. Dr. Kingston showed lantern slides to demonstrate a simple star map. And several Sorry. copies of his book, An Easy Pocket Guide for Beginners were sold to members. Um, now, if you want to get a copy of that book, you don't need to buy it, it's free. It's on the RESC archives. You just need to uh, search down through the archives and to look for that uh, book. So you can, you can download it. Um, by the end of 1922, the membership was at 49. And uh, they decided that uh, the, the, at the November meeting that December would be a social meeting. And uh, the, a committee was formed of, of three members. They were all female, it was common in those days. And they arranged that meeting. And they also arranged to audit the financials of the, of the club. Uh, the treasurer reported a balance of $22.67. <laughs> um, now, the meetings um, carried on uninterrupted even during the war years. From the beginning, they were held at the Huron College or the normal school or the library. Starting in 26, they were occasionally held at the Science Building, which is now the Physics and Astronomy and the Arts Building, which is now known as University College. Um, in 27, some meetings were at the uh, London Life Building. And of course, in October of 40, the Hume Cronin Observatory was opened. There. And of course, the centers also met at many locations at the university and all over the city. Um, I'll skip all of that. Observing meetings. Uh, the first one I found was uh, June 1925 at the Saunders Farm in Pond Mills. They gathered at the home of William Edwin Saunders for a social evening of games, refreshments, and observing with telescopes. In June of the following year, there was another observing meeting at the farm. And, it, and the minutes of that read, over 40 members met in front of doc, Dr. Saunders' residence on Central Ave. And from there, they proceeded by auto to his farm where a very successful observations of sunspots were projected onto a screen for safe viewing and observations of the moon and the rings of Saturn were also made. Out of town members attending were a Reverend and Mrs. Colgrove, Colgrove of Cedar Springs. I believe Cedar Springs is down near um, Blenheim. And refreshments were served by Mrs. Kingston's committee and a fine time was had by all. I know Dr. Sanders was the founding president of the Federation. Being recorded. I was once the head of the chemistry department. Um, he was, he, um, his, his family, his father and himself, is, uh, they named the uh, Saunders Secondary School after him. At the December 26th annual meeting, that was the first banquet of the London Center. It was held at the Blue Dragon uh, Tea Room. I, I couldn't find where that was. Uh, uh, Dr. Saunders uh, presided as chair and Toastmaster. At that meeting, that was the banquet given to honor Dr. Kingston and Dr. White and their wives. And Dr. Sanders, Saunders read a congratulatory telegram and poems, including the one that um, David, uh, David wrote, uh, read to us earlier. And then, Rick showed this one earlier. The London Center sponsored a display of astronomical instruments at the Williams Memorial Library. Um, the exhibit lasted for a week um, in April of 1952, and it was manned constantly by members of the center. Um, of course, many of the items that are seen in the image are, are at the Cronin. Um, you can see there's some youth members. So that would be like our first astronomy week. This is, you know, pre uh, mall displays. Um, in 63, the estate of Dr. Kingston bequeathed funds to the center. The proceeds were used annually to bring a noted astronomer to address the London Center in, in memory of H.R. Kingston. 
Um, the first image on there at the top was from the 1980 banquet and that uh, the, the speaker, um, so that was um, John Percy. Um, over the years, London's had five honorary presidents, 41 presidents and 29 treasurers, 15 editors, and I can go on and on, but that image there shows seven past presidents. And for those of you that have been around long enough and, or uh, might even be in that shot, you, you know who they are. <laughs> image at the bottom is from 1973, Chris Essex, Bill Smythe, myself, and Mike Wallace. So in 1973, 1978, and 1980, the London Center um, successfully um, created a, a proposal to receive uh, funds from the pr provincial government. And in 73, it was called the Opportunities for Youth Grant, changed the name over the years, but basically um, we re received funds. I think the in 78, it was like $12,000, 8,000 and 80, but it was to employ student members. And we know we, we called it Project Zubinel Janubi. And Dale's presentation had that star chart and actually had Zubinel Janubi on it. <laughs> in 73, Half Telescope Will Travel was the motto. In 73, there was school talks, interviews, well, uh, no, sorry, school talks, and we, and we created a book. And uh, in 1978, there was the, uh, uh, they rented a van and they brought telescopes all over the city and parks and, and Dale um, was on, uh, I think Mark Finkins as well and Bill and a few others. Yep, yeah. uh, skip all that. And uh, lastly, I'm gonna, just gonna mention that in the 1980s, we were a member of the Niagara Council of Amateur Astronomical Association. That is a, uh, a group of astronomy clubs centered around Niagara, Niagara Falls, um, including uh, Rochester and Syracuse and Finger Lake and Buffalo and Niagara Falls and Hamilton and London and did I miss any? Well, there may be others. And we held, uh, there was speaker exchanges and information exchanges, and we would go to, um, to summer parties and, and uh, meetings and banquets. And we held a couple of meetings at the London um, in the 80s uh, for the NFC AAA. Uh, and in the London centers had quite a few things, and I won't just, I'll just I won't touch on them, I'll just real quick. Um, the, even as far back as the 30s, there were expeditions um, and, and of course, lots of trips. Um, we've had amateur telescope making all the way back also into the 30s. Um, one of the telescopes in this image in the upper right, Walter Cantley created that. I don't think that's the one who won at cellophane, but he recently won at cellophane. Of course, we've held three GAs. Um, we've had many mall displays over the years. Um, we have the the loner telescopes. I don't know if they're still around, but um, public outreach and star nights, eclipses, uh, meteors. Yeah, uh, Peter Jedicky did his TV show back in the day. We had uh, oh, I when I was mentioning the newsletters and the website and the forum, I I, I came across that uh, Joe Neal had the bulletin board. And I forgot about that and the picnics and the banquets and the. Uh, for quite a few awards. Peter will touch on that in a minute. So I'm going to pass it off to PJ and he's going to continue with uh, the, uh, the rest. Well, thank you very much, Eric. And just in case anybody has any doubts, we definitely, Eric has contributed an awful lot to the London Center in these 50 years since he joined. And so Congratulations and thanks. And I will be saying a few words and I'll mention Eric's name again, along with some others. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I, let's give it a try here. And how am I doing? Is that, is that, uh, yep. is that full screen for everyone? Yep. Yes. Great. Yep. Okay, good. So, um, you know, there's an awful lot of memories and between Mark and Eric, we've kind of filled in that big gap from 1922 until many of our current generation pick up the memories back around the 1970s or so. 
I want to also introduce David Turner, who's on this call. And Dave was a member of the London Centre back in the early 1970s when he was a PhD student here at Western University. And uh, Dave's basically retired now from a long career as a research astronomer uh, for a while in uh, Sudbury at Laurentian U and then for a very long time at St. Mary's University in Halifax. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but um, we'd like to maybe ask you to share a few memories maybe at the end, anything that I that I say might inspire or trigger a memory in you if you if you like to share at the end. So uh, I'd like to talk about the London Centre specifically in the context of our um, participation in a national society. You know, it's one thing to have a local astronomy club that uh, goes about its business and does things locally. But I remember as a young person when I came to London, uh, even before, I, I grew up in Niagara Falls and I remember the Niagara Falls, there's a Niagara Centre. And I, I never was a member of the Niagara Centre, but I did go to a couple of public events that they had. And I remember thinking how wonderful it was that you know, there's a Canada-wide society so that folks who love astronomy can share all this and get together and share all kinds of resources and so on. So I'd like to break up the history of the RASC into four separate phases. And I hope I'll give a fairly objective view, I hope, of what uh, went on in those phases. And I'll start with phase one, which represents the founding of the RASC it was known in those days as the Toronto Astronomical Club in 1868 because it was founded in Toronto. And seriously, Toronto, you know, was a big market even in those days, but Canada was a fairly primitive frontier land at that time. So there wasn't really much opportunity to do much uh, outside of a center like Toronto. In 1884, they changed their name, uh, maybe just to represent the fact that astronomy was becoming much more concerned with matters that might traditionally have been known as physics. In other words, things like spectroscopy that Mark talked about earlier and so on. It was a really big deal for, for astronomy in the latter portion of the 19th century to start uh, working on that grand project. But I just wanted to emphasize that in those days, it would have been very difficult for folks from across the country, this far flung land of ours, to get together or even to communicate with one another. The postal mail was basically all you had. And in a way, that leaves us with a good historical record. And the uh, society's archives held in Toronto uh, do have an awful lot of correspondence going back even to those very early days. You can see there on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, I've recreated the cover of the transactions of the RASC for 1905. This was the kind of thing that you would receive if you were an RASC member in those days. So in in 1903, I'm going to call it a transition when the RASC really became truly national, even if it was difficult, because at that time, um, think King, I think it was King Edward, maybe someone who's an expert in royalty can fix, figure, uh, can fix that if I'm wrong. In 1903, the RASC was granted a royal charter, and that was when we became known as the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. At first, of course, it was still centered in Toronto, and I think folks realized right away that calling it the RAS of Canada, you know, required some effort to reach out across this great country. And so in Ottawa, and according to the historical summaries that I've read, the, in the early days, the Ottawa group didn't really um, interact much with the Toronto group. But in 1906, they decided to join up and become what they called at that time a section of the RASC in Ottawa. They, they, they were the first center essentially. At that time, as a center started to grow in numbers, there were a couple of centers out west and even a couple of centers in smaller cities here in Southern Ontario that sadly didn't survive. But uh, there were a few of those. But I wanted to emphasize that in those days, the National Council, it was just called the council basically, really ran everything for the society and the local clubs were held responsible for basically implementing any rules or procedures that uh, were decided upon at the national level. So you might imagine that in today's world, this would cause some friction because local organizations like to have a lot more autonomy. And I think if, if, if I project my thoughts back, I think probably those local chapters 
really did appreciate having uh, a national umbrella to uh, to kind of refer to and feel part of. And I, I, I really want to emphasize that I think that adds an awful lot to any local club to be part of an organization like the RASC. It took a long time before centers were actually represented on the National Council. That wasn't really until the 1950s, an awful lot of water had to pass under the bridge. But I still want to part, uh, call that the sort of the second phase when the Things were centered very much in Toronto, but gradually expanding outward to uh, incorporate the whole country. The society had a, a room or rooms in various places in downtown Toronto, always close to the university, since that's where most of the resources were. The spaces were always rented. There was a, a woman named Eva Budd, who was a part-time staff member who basically ran the office for 36 years, from 1912 to 1948. Imagine that kind of, that, that level of continuity, that level of commitment that she had for our society. And I've never seen a photo of her. I don't know if maybe they're there somewhere in the, in, in the, in the archive somewhere, but it really means a lot to me that she was able to stick with the society and the society felt it, uh, felt it was a good idea to have that kind of continuity. So I'm gonna mention a few times here about the publications of the society. Again, partly because in recognition of the fact that really the postal mail was the only way you had to interact with other, other astronomers. Having printed material, of course, was gold. That was really what it was all about. And not only was the Observer's Handbook uh, printed beginning around 1905, under the, direct, uh, under the editorship of, of Clarence Chant, who I'll mention again shortly. Uh, and it really became widely respected, not just across Canada, but certainly into the United States. In the USA, of course, they were kind of, they have their much bigger market, but they never really had one national society. And so even for folks who are members of local clubs uh, in the USA, they often would purchase the the RASC's Observer's Handbook as their way of getting information and data that was appropriate for an individual year. This was a really good idea and really gave the RASC a powerful reputation, of course. Um, we also had a library where many books were kept and other kinds of artifacts as well, things like binoculars and telescopes. The telescopes, of course, were mainly loaned in Toronto for folks who could actually go there. But in principle, a person from anywhere in Canada could ask for a library book or for some item of astronomical equipment, slides, for instance, to be sent to them by postal mail. And this was a real benefit to belonging to the society. Uh, now, through that entire second phase, I want to mention that there was kind of a resistance to change. It was very much a traditional kind of organization, you know, where reports were read in great detail and folks would pontificate at length and things had to be seconded and motions. And as Eric mentioned, in order to join, you had to actually be uh, nominated and elected to membership. That kind of formality that we kind of might laugh at today was really taken quite serious in those days. And I just see David has, David Levy has just sat down and in David's biography, there's a wonderful story about how as a member of the Montreal Center, he almost lost his RAC membership for just being a young and enthusiastic teenager. And I think we know how that feels. And I think that's a big part of the story. Eric mentioned the formal beginning of the RASC and the, uh, in London as London Center. And uh, this, this occurred. So basically our official 100th anniversary would have been on February 24th because that is the anniversary of the day that the, the council in Toronto met and uh, this is from the minutes of that meeting. A letter was received from Dr. White of the Normal School, London, Ontario, asking that the council approve the formation of a center. And we had submitted, London Center had submitted a list of officers along with uh, 30 charter members. And of course, $60, which is what the fees were. That would, wouldn't even cover one membership today. And so it was moved at the council in Toronto that the London Center begin its existence on the 24th of February, 1922. And I added those bullets just because I like the format of things. Of course, if you actually look at the minutes themselves, it just all is in one big paragraph. So the next meeting of the club, which Eric mentioned took place on March the 4th, 
at the Huron College buildings on Grosvenor Street. That would have been our actual first meeting as an official London Centre. And so that's this month, and that's where we're kind of getting, it's where we're coming from choosing today as our, uh, as our centennial meeting. Some wonderful things happened that month. You saw Eric give a list of some of those, and I decided I'd add one on to that. And our first public event intended to share our enthusiasm for astronomy and another example of the connections that we got by being a national society occurred in January of 1923 on what was our first anniversary. And so it was in celebration of our first anniversary then. And Clarence Chant was the guest of honor. He came down from Toronto. Again, that would have been a really big deal to, I, I presume he took the train because in 1922, 23, I think even the roads that you would have to drive on from London to Toronto, uh, from Toronto to London and back again, would have been quite a challenge compared to what we're used to today. Dr. Chant, of course, was not only a, 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 a leader of the national RASC and a former and, and a national president, but he was a professor at U of Toronto, probably Canada's most famous astronomer. And eventually he became the, 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 the driving force behind the establishment of the DDO, the David Landau Observatory, which is Canada's largest telescope and still is um, there in, in uh, what's now Richmond Hill, north of Toronto. And that, in, fr in fact, the closeness of uh, Dr. Chant to London and his familiarity and friendship with Dr. Kingston may have been a factor in getting Cronin Observatory established here in London uh, in 1940. And that's also a big part of our history. The article that you see there, the clipping from the London Free Press uh, in 1923, describes what Dr. Chant talked about. Dr. Chant was sent to the western coast of Australia, believe it or not, in 1922, to view the total eclipse of the sun and help verify that Einstein's theory about gravitational relativity uh, is indeed correct. And so that's what Chant talked about when he was here in London that night, uh, also very long ago. And the, in fact, I did find one other reference the night before this on January 12th, 1923, in the Free Press under social notes. It says that Dr. Chant and his wife were entertained for dinner by Dr. Kingston and his wife here in London in advance of Dr. Chant's visit. And at the bottom there, if you can see it in the bottom right-hand corner, it says that Dr. Kingston in a happy manner congratulated London Center upon the success of the first birthday party. And you know, Dr. Kingston, I'm sure somewhere is smiling at our 100th anniversary tonight. In those days, the second phase of the RASC was characterized by professional academics as leaders in the society. Most of the national presidents were research astronomers. We had connections with um, the provincial government. Provincial government gave, gave the, na the National Society uh, uh, a grant every year to help with publication costs and so on. That of course ended up being a benefit for um, for all members, because you know we would not we would we would not have been able to offer membership at two dollars a year uh, with the quality of the publications that we had in those days. And as Eric mentioned, H.R. Uh, Kingston was our first London Center member who stepped up to the national stage after he served as president locally for the first eight years of our club's existence. He then was national vice president, first vice president, and uh, then <clears throat> national president for two years in 1930 and 31. And in 1931, Professor Kingston stepped down as center president. He was voted in as honorary president and remained that way until he passed away. That's one thing, Eric, I was going to get you to fix that. Then you said he was honorary president until 1970, but of course he passed away in 1963 and that was the end. I actually, if he became uh, honorary president on January 1st, 1931, it's 11,250 days that, before the day he passed away. Uh, gradually, as Professor Kingston got on, got on in years, he was Dean at Western of the uh, Extension Studies. And that's, that took, he, he started that role in the early 1950s, but then his health gradually failed and he took less and less of a role in uh, uh, faculty affairs at Western. And he was kind of replaced as the main faculty member interested in astronomer by a gentleman named William Whalow. You see him in the red oval here. This photo is actually an actual meeting of the National Council. Uh, when the National Council expanded in the 1950s to, to, be rep, to have representations uh, on it, 
representatives from the centers. At first, it was center presidents that were represented. And uh, so anyway, Professor Weilau is in this photo. Professor Weilau and his, and his wife, Amelia, who was also a professional astronomer, both of them were on faculty at Western U. And basically, for the extent of their lifetimes, they were representing the London Center on the faculty and vice versa uh, through the 1960s and into the 1970s and 80s and beyond. Now, so that phase of uh, professional academic leadership lasted up until I'm going to say somewhere around, you know, the, the 19 and early 1960s. And here's a page highlighting national publications. Um, the, the clip that I put there is actually a clip from the National RASC's annual report, where it was expected that every year each center would present a summary of the club meetings during that year. This tradition continues to the present day. Uh, we no longer publish our local center reports in the journal, but it was, but they were published in the journal in those days. And this is the list of our meetings in 1929 as published in the journal of the RASC. Eric also mentioned that uh, local um, local activities had our local talent, Professor Kingston specifically, had an opportunity to access national market for our work. And so Professor Kingston's book called An Easy Pocket Guide for Beginners. I just looked at it the other night in preparation for to tonight. And, I, and it's really quite a wonderful book. It's all black and white, of course, but it's got the star maps and the sort of, you know, looking uh, at the heavens. If you're a beginner, it's a really neat thing to have. Um, and it is now available, as Eric mentioned, on the RAC's national website. You can go there and download this thing that Professor Kingston wrote and uh, made available for publication back in the late 1940s. I just think that's a wonderful advantage to our modern technology. And in a way, uh, the easy pocket guide for beginners was kind of a preview or a, a prequel to a publication that uh, took place, started in the 1980s called the Beginner's Observing Guide, which member from Kingston, Ontario, Leo Enright originated and looked after for many years. We also started a national newsletter in the 1970s, which originally was published together with the journal. It was kind of stapled into the journal. And that was a place where local clubs could um, produce, could send in reports, reports of meetings or even upcoming notices of upcoming events and so on. That was a big deal back in the 1970s and through the 1980s and so on. In the 1990s, one of our uh, national presidents, Rajiv Gupta, started an observer's can calendar. I hope many of you have yours for the year 2022, which uh, has been available now for a few months. And Rajiv actually went so far as to make software specifically to help him do that every year. It was really kind of neat. And you know, we've always had our publications sell quite well outside the membership of the RAC. And this and that generated revenue, which really for years and years and years through you know, the second phase and into the third phase of the RAC's existence helped to balance our budget. Thank goodness for that. Or again, membership fees would have been much, much uh, higher. I also can't help mentioning um, W.G. Colgrove, who won the, R the National RAC's Chant Medal in 1942. The Chant Medal is still to this day Canada's highest award for an amateur astronomer who conducts research or original work. Um, David Levy is one of the winners from 1980. And there are many other very deserving winners. The uh, award is not necessarily given every year. Um, often we just let, it, let the award pass and, until we see someone come along with a worthy effort in this, uh, in this field. Colgrove did uh, a lot of work at Cronin Observatory as a volunteer, we haven't been able to prove whether or not Colgrove was actually paid for any of the things he did for uh, Kingston and for astronomy at, at the Cronin Observatory, but he made an awful lot of wonderful uh, demonstration apparatuses and so on. And Mark has a bunch of them in the Cronin Observatory and has uh, shown them uh, on many opportunities. So uh, that was what the first, that was the first time a London Center member won recognition at the national level in the RASC. And on the slide here, you see both sides of Colgrove's chant medal. Um, this came back to us, at least uh, for the for viewing, 
a few years ago when the Cronin Observatory had its 75th anniversary and we reached out to Colgrove's family. And in fact, uh, three of Colgrove's grandchildren are sitting there in the slide uh, with Mark uh, in the basement of Cronin Observatory. So they brought with them the, the medal itself and let us take photos. The chain that it's attached to has a watch on the other end. You won't be surprised to hear. Another member of the RASC London Center in the late 1940s that's worth noting is Donald M. Hennigar. He worked as an architect for London Life, and he was an amateur telescope maker who built at least three telescopes that we're aware of, including this one, a 20 centimeter Newtonian, which um, is, is in our possession right now. I'm going to mention it a little later on. He, the telescopes were held by his family and so they have this one, uh, at least two of the telescopes have survived. We know where that other one is. I'll mention it a little later. So I would like to propose that the third phase of the RASC be considered to begin with a changeover to the space age. You know, we can name it to pin it down to one day, and that's, of course, the launch of Sputnik in 1957. But really, it was a gradual transition as members of the baby boomer generation folks who were born between 1946. Is Dave McCarter on this uh, on this evening? I forgot to check if Dave's on our participants, but you know, Dave McCarter was, his birthday is January 4th, 1946. So he is pretty much the first baby boomer in the London Center. And I think he's the first baby boomer I know. I don't know anybody who was born in the three days of baby boomerness before Dave McCarter was born. Anyway, I, I personally, I think space exploration inspired all of us. You know, even if you weren't close to a center, close to an astronomy club, close to a university, you were still able to read the local newspapers wherever you were, watch it on TV. The space age was a huge inspiration for folks. And of course, in those days, there was a, a general trend in society, a cultural uh, phenomenon where a little bit of disrespect was thrown in towards the older generation. My quote here, Mark and I talked about this the other night, and Mark reminded me it was Timothy Leary who said, turn on, tune in, drop out. And folks were, I think of Bob Dylan's music, folk singing from the 1960s, all the sit-ins, the demonstrations, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of that stuff got, got kind of absorbed into a subculture like astronomy with young folks who were not really any longer willing to go with the sort of traditional and rather stiff collared you know, approach that uh, was was what the second phase was done used. Anyway, in order to facilitate facilitate all this, you had to have a better chance to interact. The 19th century using trains and postal communication really wasn't going to cut it in this third phase. And so gradually, I think it's fair to say, that with the roads improving, even you know, train fare, airplanes, and uh, communication telephones, and eventually, of course, the internet that uh, made, th made it possible for us to interact with each other across the country. And, and if anything, it just made our membership as a part of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada even more valuable to the London Centre. The slide here shows Rosemary Freeman, who many of us knew well. She was the executive secretary from, I think, around 1972 uh, until something like 1998 or even, even maybe into 2000. Uh, yeah, I think it was 1998. Anyway, so, so for 25 years or so, she sat in the desk at the national office and uh, answered the phone if Eric, when he was treasurer, or if other leaders of local clubs had any issues with what was going on and their relationship to the National Society, Rosemary was the first point of contact. And for a while, our national headquarters was in a building that the society owned at 136 DuPont Street, and that's what the building looked like. It's, uh, it, of course, the door was always open. Any member of the RAC across the country, uh, you know, the membership was typically in the 1970s and 80s, typically in the high 3000s into the 4000s at any given moment. Any one of those members could have gone up to Toronto, knocked on the door, said hi to Rosemary, had a look at the library, which was in the basement of that building. And, you know, that was kind of like a home for the society. We had that until 2008 when it was sold and since then, the National Society has been in rented quarters. All right, now to our own contribution. You know, the London Center in the 1970s, we were part of this younger generation, the baby boomers and so on. 
And one of the best ways for a local center to make a statement at the national level was to offer to host the national meeting, which was called the General Assembly. And so 1979 was London's first chance to host the General Assembly. The upper right is the group photo, which was a very traditional kind of thing. But we tried to break with tradition in many different ways. And one of those was having a song contest, which you see the photo of the song contest there in the lower left. Uh, you might recognize Doug Welch, who's now a professor at McMaster University. He's on the right-hand side of that picture. Rolf Meyer is in the middle. Rolf, of course, is a comet discoverer from Ottawa who sadly passed away a few years ago. At the far left, I'll, uh, I'll embarrass him now, is Mike Flagel, who's on the call this evening. Mike's been a member of the RASC since something like 1970. He joined in Toronto where he grew up. Anyway, we did an awful lot of fun things at the 1979 GA. The lower right shows the banquet, which was held in the Great Hall at Western U. And the guest of honor seated there to my left underneath the crests was Gerard K. O'Neill, a physicist at Princeton University who made his fame by introducing the idea of building space colonies. And that's the, that's the presentation that he gave that night. As far as I know, it was the first time that O'Neill had given that presentation in Canada. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how I would check that, but I've never heard of any other uh, opportunities that O'Neill had to speak about his work in uh, Canada before that. The 1979 GA was a tremendous fun time and uh, it's, it's really a great memory for a lot of us. Then in 1982, we did celebrate our 60th anniversary. In other words, this is what we are missing tonight because of COVID. This was the uh, program cover of the event uh, held on March the 19th, which was held at the Art Gallery downtown. And our guest of honor that night was Bart Bach, who of course lived in Tucson and David Levy wrote his biography around that time. The reason that we thought it was particularly appropriate for Bart Bach to be our guest of honor that night was that Bart Bach was basically just winding down his career as a very significant contributor to our knowledge of the Milky Way. And he had started his career almost exactly at the time the London Center started. So he, we asked him to give a talk on the theme, my 60 years as a Milky Way astronomer, and he was wonderful. He was lighthearted. He was fun, good spirit, and it was a great, great event and great, great, wonderful Diamond Jubilee banquet. In the 1990s, it got to be uh, more and more common for amateur astronomers to take leadership roles, replacing the old tradition of having research astronomers, professional scientists, and the leadership. And so gradually, more and more often, it, was, it, would, it, was, it, it became common for amateur astronomers to be national president of the RAC. And one of the fun things that uh, took place looking back on the society's history since the, uh, since the RESC's uh, Royal Charter was in 1903, we kind of were starting to plan the idea of having a centennial in 2003. And so Peter Broden, a member of the Toronto Centre and a national president himself, who had a career as a teacher and not as a professional scientist, he made an awful lot of effort, a tremendous amount of work to create this book called Looking Up. And it was really kind of interesting for a short while, we were worried that once the print run ended, it might be impossible to get a hold of a copy of this for younger folks who might want to take an interest in the history. But of course, now I'm pleased to tell you that you can go to the RAC's national website, you can download the entire book as a PDF file, and you can read it at your leisure and refer to it. And in fact, some of the slides that I've used here this evening, I actually just took them right straight from looking up. I didn't have copies of them myself. So in the 1990s, gradually, publications still dominated revenue. But as the internet started to grow, of course, more and more folks were relying on instant gratification to get information about where the planets are at night or something like that. And so the Observer's Handbook began to, uh, you know, not sell as many as before. Even to this day, we still make a good chunk of change on the national re revenue from publications like that. But you could see that it wasn't going to really be able to support the whole society anymore. So that kind of presaged an important trend. Now, on one hand, the centers demanded and received more autonomy to do things their own way and so on. 
But on the other hand, fees kept rising and rising, and this got to be a, a bit of a problem over the years. I'm pleased to say folks in recent years haven't complained about the, the um, fees rising as much, but the fees still are going up. Uh, I have Dave Clark, who's sitting on this call as well, to thank for the fact that we no longer have life memberships. Life memberships were really bleeding the society because a person would pay once and never have to pay again. So we had to put a stop to that. Our 75th anniversary took place in 1997. Uh, on the right-hand side, I'm not sure if you've got your, I've got my, uh, my, my participants list over there. You know, so you'll have to kind of knock that off for a moment. Paul Chodas is shown at the far right in the slide. Paul Chodas grew up as a member of the London Center in the 1950s. He was here in London. And then he became a math expert, got his degree at the University of Waterloo, and has basically spent his entire career at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. He's now the director of the Center for Near-Earth Observation Studies. And of course, that relates to asteroids coming to the Earth and all that neat stuff. So he came to London in 1997, visited his family, gave us a wonderful presentation. We had our meeting that day. It was a Saturday. Uh, Dave Turner will remember. I remember Dave was here that, that weekend. We also hosted a National Council meeting that day. One of the things that National Council wanted to do was try and involve, try and involve centers a little more in uh, national kind of activities without necessarily having to host a general assembly. So we did that, and that's a picture of the National Council meeting. This was all held at the London Convention Center downtown, which is a which was a fairly new facility at that time. And the dinner was there in one of the banquet rooms. It was a family platter dinner. I thought this would really catch on, but it hasn't. Instead of having a buffet where everybody has to get up from their table and go over and scoop food onto their plates, what happened was the servers would bring large platters of food to each table. And then you just took, you shared it with your table mates. You didn't have to get up but you also didn't have to feel like you were limited to just what one plate of food meant. I thought that was a really cool idea and it never really caught on. Anyway, that was 1997 and another great memory for, for, all, for the, those of us. And then of course, we hosted the, the General Assembly again in 2001. We wanted to be as innovative as, pos as possible. So it was the first time that online registration was offered. We changed one important thing about the format in the past, General Assemblies had always kind of emphasized there would be one person was the keynote speaker, and then you'd have you know individual talks that were mostly invited, or you had to apply ahead of time to give a talk. We decided to make it more of a workshop kind of a format where there'd be multiple presenters, all of them invited. And so we had a se sequence of workshops. We had some folks that were well known to our membership or perhaps had some uh, you know stat status in astronomy. William Hartman gave the Northcott lecture that year. That was the main lecture of the society. And he was also from Arizona and had studied the planetary systems for a while, for all his life basically, and gave a talk about poetry and artists and Mars. And we wanted to do as many fun things as we could. We tried to emphasize fun as much as possible. Uh, award presentations were part of it. That's Peter Brown over on the right getting the Plaskett Medal. The Plaskett Medal is the award for the top PhD thesis in Canada. And Peter Brown is the London Center member and won that award that year. And it was given to him here at our General Assembly. Part of the fun, of course, was to have lots of parties. We made that into, we, we built that into the activities of the assembly. And so one of the little, one of the little cartoons that we used was Albert Einstein saying, sure, space time has warped. Just look at the London Center. And we use the graphics from 2001, A Space Odyssey, the movie, as our kind of logo. I wanted to mention Dave Clark, who's taken a big role at the National Society for quite a few years. He was national treasurer for two years, uh, three years, basically, 2004 to 2006. And Dave's also very popular and very well known across the society. He's contributed a lot to London Center's reputation there. He was uh, chair with me of the General Assembly Committees in 2001 and 2016. And of course, there he is with uh, astronaut Ken Jeremy Hansen, who might be the first Canadian to go to the moon. I'm not sure if that's been announced yet, but uh, that's part of the Artemis project. Anyway, way to go, Dave. And it's been great having you as part of the team all these years. This is a <laughs> list, I'm pretty sure it's complete, of all London Center members who've won awards at the national level. 
uh, including Coal Grove in 1942, the Plaskett Medal in 2001. Uh, Steve Gauthier, who's here tonight as well, uh, and Dave Toth, both were uh, winners of the 2008 Chilton Award, which was granted for their uh, work in discovering supernovas. And then Bob Duff, who's here tonight, Bob, welcome, won the 2013 KELAC Award, which is given for contribution to outreach in astronomy across Canada. And we have, what is that, eight uh, service award winners listed there. Service award is given for folks who've done a lot, either for a local center over a long period of time or at the national level. And in fact, the picture at the bottom there is uh, six of those service awards. They were bronze men, they are bronze medals, and we had them all set up together there once at a little celebration. Also wanted to mention what's been going on at Fingal. Dale fills us in every month on what's happening. I don't really need to say much about this, but as part of London Center's history, Fingal has a big, big voice, a big part to play in it. And I just wanted to kind of run through what we've done there in the past. So in the 1990s, there were no facilities. We just set up our telescopes where the Northeast entrance is. And then in the 2000s, we, uh, we received permission to build temporary structures. The warm-up room was the first one. We call it the WUR. The picture in the bottom of this slide doesn't quite show the warm-up room that was built first, but it shows the, uh, oh, sorry, correct. I, uh, sorry, that is the warm-up room. The green building is the warm-up room and the building with the dome slid off, with the roof slid off there, that's OBS-1. And this picture was taken at the ceremonial opening there in 2012 and a year later, they, uh, we added a second observatory, which Dale showed the slide of that a little bit ago already. And uh, David Levy was here. At the, we had a barbecue to celebrate the opening. Well, folks, I've uh, gotten pretty close to the end of our retrospective of the 100 years. Maybe the most recent really big event that London Center did on the national stage was to host the 2016 General Assembly, uh, also held in May at Fanshawe College. We, all, we Like we did in 2001, we used the idea of having it all in one site so that folks didn't have to go walking all the way across a big campus or something like that, basically just run down the hall and all the meetings were held together and the dorm at Fanshawe College, the residence was used for everybody to stay in and we had a great time and you see some of the things there that we did. I like to, I like to think that our reputation as being the center that does the best job hosting national events was maintained and even perhaps expanded by the 2016 General Assembly. Today, um, a lot, I think we can say that the National Society has kind of entered a fourth phase over the last, let's say, 10 years or so. We've made this transition. We are now in a phase where things are much more professionally managed. Instead of having folks who get elected and um, work you know, in some other field and then just volunteer, to be leaders of the society. We now have an executive director and the governance was restructured. I have a the sort of quick view here of how the society is run today. And this is really quite different from past days. Now, instead of electing a president, we now have a board of directors and an executive director on uh, at our national office. The executive director also has a staff these days, which of course would have been unthinkable uh, even just 20 years ago or so. And um, let's see, I did, yeah, this is our current executive director on the left, Phil Groff, and on the right is Randy Atwood, who's a former national president and was uh, executive director before Phil and kind of represents kind of a bridge. You know, Randy was a very professional person, but he was an amateur astronomer serving as executive director. Phil's background is in, um, Nonprofit organizations, and he has expertise in that. So it's it represents a kind of a shift. Our board of directors is elected by we, by us as members, but then they choose among themselves who will be the president or who will be the vice president, and so on. Nowadays, we don't want to we don't refer to things as the national office anymore. We call it the society office. I'm not sure I really understand whether there's a big difference, but that's the preferred terminology these days. And there have been changes legally as well. The Canada Revenue Agency in the mid 2000s made a big push to have all charitable organizations in Canada uh, conform to certain accounting standards and so on. 
And it, one of the fun things actually that the RASC can kind of take some pride in is that we were one of the first um, charitable organizations to kind of adopt the Canada Revenue Agency's new model. And uh, I'm not sure if it's still there today, but for a number of years, the CRA on their national government website used the RASC as an example of how a club should make the transition to this new uh, regime of accounting practices and so on. Part of that also is that um, clubs are not allowed to have associate members. You're either a member of the RASC or you're not. In the old days, most centers had a kind of a, a nod and a wink arrangement where a person could join just the club, consider themselves a member of London Center without being a member of the RASC. That's not allowed anymore under the federal government rules. So, uh, oh yes, I did want to mention that we have a new society headquarters. The uh, rented facility that was out in West Toronto for the last 10 years or more has been vacated and we're now on back on College Street, which is actually close to the university again. And uh, 489 College Street is the address. And it's important here in my last slide, I wanted to come back to the Hennigar reflector as a way of tying everything together. This photo is the Hennigar reflector at a party that we held. The fellow at the bottom left is Kirby Alguire. And Kirby was a friend of Henniger's grandchildren. And so the grandchildren said to Kirby, we've got these telescopes. We know you're interested in astronomy. We'd like to give them to someone who will appreciate them. And it occurred to Kirby that the RAC would probably be interested. And so that's how the 20 centimeter Henniger reflector came back to us in 1999. It was partially refurbished by Dave Rubenhagen, Dave McCarter, and Mike Haynes, who we sometimes call Dave by mistake. And recently it's been stored out at uh, the warm-up room at Fingal, but we never really had the resources or really a place to put it, uh, to put it on display and kind of give it the attention it deserves as a part of history and perhaps even a good representative example of an amateur telescope maker's uh, best efforts, you know, from the mid part of the 20th century. So it turns out that Rudolf Dorner, a member of the Kitchener Center, donated money to the society to establish a telescope museum at this new society office that we just moved into. And so we made um, an offer of having the Hennigar Reflector be part of the Dorner Telescope Museum. That offer has been accepted. And in fact, this is great news. Here we are, 100th anniversary. We plan in the next little while to take the Hennigar reflector up to Toronto and uh, whether it's on display or whether it's just part of the telescope museum collection, it will now be part of the national, uh, the best thing Canada has, the closest thing Canada has to a museum for astronomy. And our contribution is the Hennigar reflector. I'm also sad to have to say that uh, Rudolf Dorner passed away just about a week ago. So it's a chance to pay tribute to him as well and his kindness and generosity. Uh, the director of the Telescope Museum is Randall Rosenfeld. Many of you will remember Randall. Randall. He, uh, he, was, he, he was our guest of honor at one of our first online meetings back uh, when the COVID thing started in the springtime of 2020. And folks, it gives me great pleasure to wrap it up now and say uh, thank you for being part of this. I, of course, no one, who's listening to my voice will be surprised if I tell you I really take it as a tremendous honor to have been part of the center all these years. Uh, tremendous thrill personally. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't stop me from enjoying the kind of fun that we've all had together. And uh, I thank you for all being part of it and being and supporting it in your own ways. And now let our second century begin. Thank you and back to Rick. Peter, can you go back a slide? Sure. I, well, maybe I can't. Hang on. <laughs> Am I still sharing? Yes. Okay, let me. So just go back. You don't need to make it full screen. Just go back a slide. Okay. How's that? Good. Okay. All right. You see the straps, the, the, the brass straps and the saddle on the Henniger reflector? There. Hold the tele. We don't have those. Oh, really? Now they may be out at the warm up room and put okay. somewhere else. But okay. I don't have those, so there's really no way right now of attaching the telescope to the mount. Oh, are you talking about these down here, further down here? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. That, that's we, we did. 
We did have that because at Mike Haynes' house, it was assembled uh, a few years ago at an executive meeting. So if you can't find them, like uh, send Mike an email and just find out what, what he has to say about where it might be. Okay. Yeah, I, was hoping, I was hoping we'd see Mike on, uh, on the call tonight, but I guess he's not here. But yeah, it's easy enough to get in touch with him. Um, okay. in, that, in, that, uh, in that picture, you'll see quite a few of our members that we recognize. Dave McCarter's in the back. There's Steve Goche. In the front row with Dave, Dave Clark, uh, Chris Fleming, okay. John. I think we, we probably Sauer. have them, and they're probably at the warm-up room, but they just weren't underneath the table with the telescope. So before Wednesday, maybe I'll drive out there. Oh no, I don't have keys. Uh, Rick, 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 Rick. Yeah. I could have sworn those are attached. Those two straps, according with the black mount, I know they were attached. With, Oh, okay. Well, I'll go I guarantee the you. The I truck. guarantee you. Those two, they are there. The the because that piece is is bolted on, and that's what made it heavy. Okay. Oh, hang on. Maybe I'm wrong. I will absolutely I guarantee you they're there. I'll go out and look at the telescope in the morning, in the back of the truck, and I will send an email to Peter Jetty and Norm with. Yep. Okay. okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Good enough. Well, well, we'll certainly take care of it one way or another going forward. It's nice to know that there are still projects to go. Thank you. Thank you, Davi. Thank you, Mark. And that picture of the grandchildren of great grandchildren? Yes, yes great grandchildren. In the background. Oh, that's a telescope I recognized in the background. Matter of fact, I got an email from my brother in Vancouver saying, whatever happened to that telescope I got for you? Because he drove down to uh, Dr. Kingston's family and picked it up in Seattle. That's the, um, Rick, if I may say so, that's that the brass refractor, the Dr. Kingston's brass refractor? Yes. That we got in what, two, two, 2012, was it? Oh. Or 2000, yeah, that, we had it at the banquet. <laughs> the, the, cross, the cross country journey of that telescope was incredible. There it is. Yeah. Who's that handsome guy? <laughs> Me and Dave uh, Rubenhagen set that up in his backyard and tried to do some simple observing with it. But I, I think the lenses needed a good cleaning. <laughs> we couldn't see anything. Oh, there's Mark. Mark is Mark is in front of. Is that uh, Kingston's refractor, Mark? Somebody's going to. Yeah, it, yes, it is. Sorry. Yes, that is Kingston Refractor back there. Yes. Okay, and so um, Rick, if you don't mind, if we if we have time, uh, I'd like to call on Dave Turner, who's over there on the right hand column of my gallery of uh, webinar participants. Welcome, Dave. And I, I've, I've said a few words already to introduce you. You're a former London Center member. Uh, and you were the first editor of our newsletter. And Dave's agreed to share a few thoughts or memories of the center's first hundred years. Take it away, uh, Dave. Okay, am I, am I on? Or? Yes, 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 we okay. got you. <laughs> um, some thoughts came to mind as, a, as a, I was listening to all of this. In fact, a lot of thoughts came to mind. I had to reach up over my desk to dig this out. I don't know whether any of you can <laughs> see this. It's a merit me. award from the London Center from 19, 1975. I thought I'd left by then. Anyway, there's a signature of Eric Clinton on the bottom, as well as Peter Andrea, who was the president at the time. So, uh, yeah, that's, I go back quite a ways. Uh, I started at Western in 1968. so. That's when the center was being revived from its death throes, I think, around then. Uh, the things that came to mind, certainly during Mark's talk, I think I think I may have seen a lot of those lantern slides he was talking about. They were certainly still in use in my era. They're called, they're called slides, of course, because of the way they were put into the projector, David. They slid right in, and 
Yes, the, there were some interesting things back in those days. I remember Helen Hogg coming for a talk in the late 60s the, to the uh, center, to, as well as to the department. And she loved to use those lantern slides, but we didn't have much experience with them. She, on the other hand, used, used them all the time. And she had her own clicker, a little clicker, which she used to indicate that she wanted the next slide put in. Normally, you just said, next slide, please. But no, she had a clicker. And the person who was in charge of the slides that day was unfamiliar with the use of clickers. And every time she clicked, he looked around for the cricket that was in the audience, and he couldn't find it. <laughs> there were other things. Uh, I note that uh, Kingston was, in fact, not a physicist. And it's noteworthy that he was, in a, he was a mathematician. I myself am a mathematician. That's my first degree, as are uh, many famous astronomers. W.W. W. Morgan, Bob Garrison was a mathematician. Brian Mitchell, first degree, was in mathematics. I believe even Arlo Landau may have been a mathematician. There are a lot of mathematicians who later became astronomers. I don't know whether you know that or not, but uh, don't be ashamed of, of, of it, uh, Kingston's background because a lot of astronomers came from the same field. Uh, Eric, it's nice to see you again. One person who actually copied my editorial style with the London Center newsletter. Uh, there should, in fact, be a history of, of, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're, we're, oh. you, you see preprints of my talk, have you, Eric? <laughs> uh, no, but I've got everything ready, just in case. Yeah. Really? Okay. I, uh, they're, they're at the 150th anniversary celebrations for the RASC a few years back, uh, a lot of the speakers at that meeting were supposed to be giving present presentations that were, were being put in, the, in a book that's being produced by Randall Rosenfeld. I understand that's still being edited. So um, if you want preprints of my own section for that, just ask me. The other things that I came, that came across, Bart Bach, love Bart Bach, and your poetry, David, is still great. And I love that uh, that logo. Sure, space time is worth just look at the London Center. Hasn't it always been that way? But congratulations on reaching a hundredth anniversary. I had no idea that today was so special. This year was so special. Uh, now I know. It's uh, been a lovely spring day here in Atlantic Canada, here on the Atlantic coast, Cool Harbor. That means that tomorrow we'll probably be back in winter again. Thank you very much for asking me to uh, help out here a bit. And as I said, congratulations on the, your hundredth anniversary. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much, Dave. It's a pleasure to see you again virtually. And um, Rick, I guess we can go back to you. Are there any other items on the agenda, or should we devolve? Oh, wait a minute. There is something really important. You might have seen it in the chat, but I'd like to ask Tom Guinos if he'd like to announce it himself. Can you unmute yourself, Tom? Maybe even. Feel like if you feel like it, turn on your calendar and let us know what you just put put in the oh. chat there a moment ago. There we go. There he hi, is. Tom. Hey, hi, hi, folks. Hey, <laughs> what a great talk. What a great night. I was so inspired listening to all this. I decided to do a little search and and I searched the asteroid database and I wondered, was there any, was there an asteroid ever named Kingston or King or whatever? And the answer is no. So during during tonight's presentations, I wrote up a little ci little citation for H.R. Kingston, and grabbed an asteroid out of my 
small repository of asteroids and and basically the citation is almost what you see it in my little chat there asteroid number 17523 will be named kingston in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the rac london and its founding citation will be a little bit longer than that but that's basically it tremendous thank you and and in fact for those of you who are newer to the club than Eric and myself and Mike Flagel and Ron Sawyer. Nobody's older than you. I know, I know. <laughs> I, but I should, I should, to do him justice, I want to introduce the fact that Tom Guinos is a former London Center president, and he's also done an awful lot of work for the London Center, and he's also been a benefactor. In fact, Dale mentioned that the telescope mount was a donation, and it was from Tom. And Tom has worked with David in Arizona uh, off and on over many years to make these asteroid discoveries. So Tom, it's, uh, I'm really choked up about that. Thank you so much for thinking of us this way and being inspired. And it's great to see you here again. And uh, once again, I'll try to shut up and turn it back to Rick here. Here it was, I thought, I thought Tom was gonna donate another mount to us. <laughs> I uh, have to say, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Peter, you know, great presentation. Thank you very much. And I think for many of us on the call here, uh, I know I joined in, I think, well, 1990. And uh, since then, uh, really, the RASC has been Peter Jedicke, uh, the London Center. I mean, it's been a quite a formidable force and a lot of fun to work with. So I just want to give uh, Peter a little uh, round of applause for the last 100 years that he's been working with the Center. Here, thank you, thank you. As I was saying, you know, you you couldn't have stopped me from doing all this. I I I've loved every second that I've spent with it, and I, you know, Diane, my wife. Many of you know Diane. She's been at my side the whole time. We've gone to GAs, had all kinds of fun at banquets and things together. It's been an absolute blast. Let's hope the next hundred years are just as much fun. I just uh, I wanted to make a, a few comments. Um, my first center was Toronto Center when I was just a youngster. And I remember being welcomed to Toronto. We met in the basement of the McLaughlin Planetarium at the time. And I was met at the door by Dr. John Percy, who said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a new member. I think I was 15 or 16 at the time. But me and my best friend, Paul Fitterer, who is now a renowned jazz drummer in the Toronto area, we used to pack our telescopes up and take them up to the DDO, which meant uh, at Steeles Avenue, you switched from one bus to another because the city of Toronto ended at Steeles Avenue. And we carry all our stuff up and set it up on the grounds of the DDO and they never bothered us. We'd observe up there. But I remember when they had a fir the first public night at the DDO that I went to, I took the bus up there and the person who was giving the tour was Dr. Helen Hogg. <laughs> and was she ever a sweet old lady? <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Are we lost here? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, I was just hoping you would you would wrap things up, Rick. But I do have I, I do notice one other thing here um, on the call is Martin Connors. And Martin, I don't know if you, your video isn't on. So okay, but uh, would you like to say a few words, Martin? Martin is a former London Center president and uh, from the 1970s and grew up here in London. And uh, I see Martin's turned his video on. That's great. Martin, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for sending the invite, Peter. Uh, it's a real blast to see the London Center having the 100th uh, anniversary. And um, maybe David can do the math better than I can being a mathematician, but I don't even remember exactly how old the London Center was when I was president. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, Due to unfortunate circumstances, a funeral, I was actually briefly in London last week. 
And I just had a comment uh, that London has grown and changed so much. And I was staying in the outskirts of London, which would have been in my time somewhere that you rode your, I rode my bicycle a lot, and it would have been somewhere that you rode your bicycle a really long time to get to. Uh, similarly, I visited an old observing site, a uh, favorite that was very dark and completely surrounded by uh, condominiums and even towers. You have many towers on the outskirts of London, which is a weird way to do it, I think, but that's what you do. And I was just thinking, you must have to drive a tremendously long distance to get out of London these days to do any good observing. So I do wish you good luck in doing that. And I guess your Fingal site is sufficiently far. I hope that it's still pretty good. Uh, so I wish you another hundred uh, good years of observing. Thanks. Well done, thank you. Uh, I wanna make an announcement if I can. Um, our vice, or sorry, our secretary Norm says he has a bunch of calendars left over that he's willing to let go for 15 bucks a pop. If anybody wants one, then uh, get in touch with Norm. I, I, I hate I hate to do this, but does anybody have any questions? Thanks, uh, everybody, for the talks and the good times this century. I hope uh, we can have some more in the next. Uh, Peter, just a comment. Um, I would not go to have a banquet 